if you've been following the entire series, the past few chapters, Paul addresses a lot of a variety of problems that have come uh, in the Corinthian church. He talks about lawsuits, marriage, factions, immorality, questionable practices, abuse of the Lord's Supper, spiritual gifts, and he also answers a lot of questions that uh, the, the Corinthian church, the people in the church has given, and he gives them his counsel. So today, he addresses one last, one final matter, and after that, he closes in with, with his remarks. So we're going to be covering this chapter in five sections. Um, and we will, what we will do is we will read through the scripture and then um, in each section and then present or look at certain comments and insights that we can get through. So the five sections that we have is helping needy saints at Jerusalem, um, coordinating the ministry work, words of exhortation, honoring those who serve and check. And uh, lastly, final greetings. So as I read through, you can follow in with me and um, we'll pick up a lo lot, of, lot of insights through that. So we're going to be looking at the first section, that is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 to 4, where Paul does talk about how it is important as a church to help people who are needy within Jerusalem. So let's read together. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 to 4. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And when I come, Whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. So we will look in verse by verse, and we're going to be looking at verse 1. And he talks about, he says, now concerning. So he's saying, okay, now let's look into this final matter that, that has come in as an issue. So he says, now concerning the collection for the saints. So what he's encouraging, Paul is encouraging the church in Corinth is to care for those who are in need, just like he has, has uh, instructed others in uh, other churches, like, like in Galatia. So he says, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. So he says, you know, guys, take up special collections so that it can be used to help the needy saints in Jerusalem. Now, when we, when we look through, when you look through um, Acts, it's, probable like, it's probably likely that there could have been a famine that occurred and it was necessary that people re really required certain materialistic needs. And also, when you look at uh, at the history of the church, the church also looks after a lot of widows. They, they used to take care of a large number of widows. And uh, so, so what, what was Paul trying to say was that it is the responsibility of a local church to also take care of the needs of, the, of those who may be needy or the needs of materialistic needs of the others within the church. So even as, so what is the application that we have? As a church, our responsibility, yes, of course, is to give to our local church, to give towards the preaching of the word, to the spiritual needs of the word, to missions, uh, all of that, for the growth, for the extension of God's kingdom, along with that, also to, be, to give to the materialistic needs of those who may have a need within the church. So that's, again, something that we can take as, as a learning, that there may be people who may be needy, and it is our responsibility as a local body, as a family, to take care of the materialistic needs of, of people. So let, uh, this is actually quite consistent with, with what is written in the New Testament. So if you look through, look through with me, uh, James talks about this as well. Okay, so James says in one, chapter 1, verse 27, and I'll read that out for you. It says, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble. So James also has instructed that that's a good practice to do, to take care of those who are needy. 
In addition, when you look into 1 Timothy uh, 5, 3, verse 3 to 13, he, uh, he, uh, Paul again instructs them to take care of people who are needy. In that, in that uh, complete passage, he specifically talks about widows, widows who need to be taken care of, who probably don't have families who uh, could protect them or who could help them. And those widows who've been serving in the church diligently and regularly. So he says, you know, uh, and those who've had a good testimony, a good report in the local church. He says, take care of them, whatever the needs may be to take care of, the, uh, take care of them. So th we can take that instruction for ourselves to be, to, as a local body, how is it that we can help and, and take care of those who may, who may require it. So we, we move on to verse 2. And uh, reading from verse 2, it, it says... On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there may be no collection when I come. So you, you can, you, the note that you can make here is the way that the church transitioned and stopped observing the Jewish Sabbath, which was on a, on a Sunday, and they moved in to meeting together on a, sorry, Jewish Sabbath that was on a Saturday and they transitioned to move uh, to meet together on a Sunday. So it specifically talks about how on the first day of the week, so he was encouraging the people every week, you know, lay your collections aside so then we can, when I come, you don't have to collect anymore, right? So then he's, he's also talking about how the church came together and how they contributed as according to what God had prospered each one of them. So that's what Paul, again, was talking about, of doing it in a regular basis, you know, meeting together and contributing to the needs of, of others. Verse 3 and 4, here he, sp he speaks about, um, and he gives wisdom. And he says, he says, send people, send people who you choose to take the gift to Jerusalem. And why does Paul do this? You know, I think he's, he's a really smart man because he does not want to, um, uh, to be accused of, be, of misappropriating the funds that have come into the church. So he said, you send people so that whatever we have collected, we can send through with, with, with them. So that's, that's again what Paul really s talks about. He's saying he, he does not want to be in a place of where he could be accused. So he, he asks that that be, that be done. And this is also very consistent in what he says, even in 2 Corinthians verse eight, uh, chapter 8, verse 21, where he says, providing honorable things not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. He says, you know, whatever we do, let's be honorable to God as well as to men. Let's never come to a place where we are accused by men either. So that's why he says, Ask someone else to come from there so that the money goes here, goes from here and, and, you know, no one is accused on that. So in this first section, Paul is specifically talking about financial stewardship. He's talking about how um, we as individuals could be good stewards of our money, not only to God, but also to men and to the church around. Are you, ch are you with me? Yes? Okay, so that's our lesson of how we can um, be good stewards, be, be right in the way that we give money, the way that we give out what God has given us, so, that we, so, so whatever he's prospered us with, we give to others as well. We move on to the second section of um, uh, verses 5 to 12. I read that again with, uh, to you. Now, this specifically, um, you know, if... For those of you who, who take flights, I'm sure you, you send itineraries to your family. Say, I'm going to be here, I'm going to be there. Yes? Yes? Yes. Okay. So that's what Paul's doing here. Okay. He's giving, him, giving you his itinerary. He's saying, hey, this is what I'm, go what I'm going to do. But, but even with that, you may say, I mean, with an itinerary, how much can we learn? There's a lot. So let's, let's look into that. So I'm going to read that, okay? Now I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia for I'm passing through Macedonia, and it may be that I will remain or even spend the winter with you, that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you, 
if the Lord permits. But I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. For a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. And if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he does the work of the Lord, as also I do. Therefore, let no one despise him, but send him on his journey in peace, that he may come to me, for I am waiting for him with the brethren. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brethren, but he was quite unwilling to come uh, at this time. However, he will come when he has a convenient time. Okay, so what's Paul doing? Like I said, he's sharing his travel plans, right? So he's, he's written this letter to the Corinthian church when he was in Ephesus, okay? And he's telling them, he's saying, you know, I do plan to come to, to Corinth, but right now I'm here in Ephesus. And, and he's, he's kind of giving his, uh, his, his thoughts and he's saying, I hope to meet you sometime. I hope to spend some time with you. So... Through these plans, what does he do? If you look with me on verse 7, there are four key words that says. It says, if the Lord permits. So even with these plans, even through these plans, he's following God's leading. Even with these plans, they're very simple plans, right? Or we, it looks simple for us. It's like us going to Bombay, going there and coming back. It looks pretty simple. But he says, uh, he's following God's leading and his plans are scheduled by what the Lord allows. So while he's writing that, he's saying, I still need to hear from God about this plan. And he's, he's saying that if the Lord permits, if the Lord wills, I will do this or I will not do that. So what is the lesson that we have from here? It is to be able to come to God with any kind of our planning or any kind of work that we desire to do. Say, God... If it is your, if it is your will, yes. Because when the Lord permits, there are going to be greater things that are, that are done. So that's, that's uh, something that Paul has, has been talking about. Now, if you look in verse 9, Paul actually gives a reason why he wishes to stay back in Ephesus. Okay? And what is this reason? So let's read through verse 9. He says... For a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. So Paul is actually saying that there is something that has opened up for him. It's, it, it says a great and effective door. Okay, so this is not a literal wooden door, right? It is, it is an opportunity. It's something that that's Paul, Paul is probably standing uh, in front of, it's, it's an effectual door, it's a mighty door, it's probably a door of blessing, it's an opportunity that's coming his way that he does not want to miss. So he's, he's actually uh, talking about the importance of that opportunity and he's saying it's important to recognize it and even respond at it. So how many opportunities have we had this week? So I remember... Um, some time ago when, uh, this, is, this is very long back, I was driving uh, in the car and I was passing through Kamnahalli and right opposite Zion Hospital, there was this lady in the car and she was, she was sitting in the front seat and she was crying, you know, she was uncontrollably crying. And in my spirit, I just felt I had to stop the car and just go and pray for her. But I did not... I did not pay attention, okay? I was too chicken. I didn't pay attention. And I know that that was a lost opportunity. And even today, whenever I pass through Zion Hospital, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Now, that's a learning lesson for me because last week when we, uh, we went to a showroom and we were talking to this guy who had a, a, a psoriasis on his, on his hand. So we met this person three times. So the first time I noticed it, and I didn't think much of it. The second time I noticed it, and I told Binny, I said, you know, this is, he's got psoriasis, and I think we should, you know, pray for him. And the third time I said, God, 
this, I should be a steward of this opportunity that you've given me. I recognize it and I want to respond to it. So then outside the car, we just stood and we said, uh, hey, you know, I've noticed this. It was on a Sunday. It was last Sunday, actually. He said, did you come back from, uh, from church? We said, yes. And I said, you know, hey, I've noticed this. May I just pray with you? And I just prayed. I don't know what's happened, but then I just believe that, that God gives us opportunities at every point of time so that we need to recognize it and also respond to it. So the opportunity can be anything. It can be maybe, um, like I said, just, just someone who you see on the street or someone around that you can just pray for or just even give a word of encouragement. Or it's probably an opportunity of you taking some Maybe it's something in college or in school or at work. Maybe a business opportunity that actually takes you places. But what Paul is really talking about is God will bring opportunities to us. And it is for us to be able to recognize it. It is for us to be able to respond to it because we are stewards of that opportunity. And that's why God brings that to us. So let me encourage you this week, this week, whatever opportunity, God will tell you. He will knock on that door. He will say, respond to the opportunity. So let's do that. At this, uh, uh, as we go through this week, let's respond to some opportunity that God has given us. Amen? Yes? Okay, great. Okay. So as we move on, uh, we move to verse 10 and 11. And at the same um, same travel plans that he has, he's also talking about people who could probably visit him. So he's talking about uh, two people here. He talks about Timothy as well as Apollos. And he's, he's telling the church, hey church, I want you to encourage people or young ministers who will be visiting you. So let's read through that, verse 10 and verse 11. It says, and if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he does the work of the Lord, as I also do. Therefore, let no one despise him, but send him on his journey in peace, that he may come to me, for I am waiting for him with the brethren. So if you look at these verses, what does Paul do? He's encouraging and he's commending Timothy for what he's done, for the work he's done in the Lord. And he's bringing that to the notice of the Corinthian church. And he tells them, Hey, you know, when he comes to visit you, although because he's young, although because he's a youth, let's not, don't despise him, don't intimidate him. So what are some of the words that he uses? He says, um, he says, see that he may be with you without fear. So he says, guys, don't intimidate him. You know, don't make him feel as if he doesn't know anything. All right. The second thing that he says is, uh, he does the work of the Lord as I also do. So he's commending. Imagine Paul commending someone, you know, younger, right? So it's like, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. Suppose your teacher commends you and say, you know, he knows biology better than I do. Isn't, isn't that good? Okay, so that's what Paul's doing over here. He's, he's encouraging and commending, I'm sorry, affirming and commending uh, Timothy. Then in verse 11, he says, let no one despise him. He says, um, None of us should look down or down on him. This this is said again earlier in sorry later in First Timothy, where he says, "Let no one despise you because you're young." Right? He he tells he, he Paul tells Timothy that because you you can be an example. So that's what he's telling the church: don't despise him, don't condemn him, because he's young. And instead, send him on his journey in peace. Instead, bless him and send him. So what are we supposed to be doing? How is this a lesson for us? So maybe this is more for probably for those of us who are maybe older, you know, and we see younger people ministering. I think we should encourage, we should endorse young people to, to just um, go out for the Lord. I mean, I was so encouraged of those 10 young people who were able to go out on those mission trip. Uh, one of them called me and she was so excited that you know she wanted me to pray for her twice before she left and that was so encouraging. And uh, you know just just to let them let them do the work of God and say hey guys you know you you can do it. So as a church body let us encourage and endorse um, uh, young people. Uh, often I I have a 14 year old and um, I'm, I'm trying to do that, to encourage him to do things for the Lord. It's not as easy when it's a teen. But, but yet, you know, I think that that's a great learning for us to be able to just 
push our young people, to encourage them into doing the work of God. Amen? Right. And then uh, Paul also talks about another established uh, uh, minister, that's, um, that's Apollos. So verse 12, he says, Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urge him to come to you with the brethren. But he was quite unwilling to come. However, he will come when he has a convenient time. So here Paul knows that Apollos is an established minister, but he respects his order. He respects what he does. And he says, you know, I, I mean, he's kind of suggesting that he will not control, he will not dictate what Apollos needs to do. And he's encouraging the church to do that as well, you know. Treat him like how you would treat me as well. So that's what we did understand from that section. We go on to the third section, that is verses 13 and 14. Okay, and these are um, Paul's final words of encouragement. So if you look at these two verses, they are power packed. You know, it's got so many verbs in it. And each of them are, are something that we, we can really imbibe and, and, and learn and understand. So if you look at these verses, they are a positive encouragement um, from Paul. Uh, probably as a backdrop of what he has been doing over the last 16 chapters. You know, if you followed, he's been correcting, he's been, um, you know, he's been admonishing, he's been saying, hey guys, you, you know, come on, pull up your socks, all of that. And this is almost like an encouragement. It comes as an encouragement at the backdrop of, of the correction that he's given them through the epistle. So there are four terms that verse 13 holds, okay? So we will go through each one of them. And if you look at those terms, it says, watch, stand fast in faith, be brave, be strong. These are all term, you know, terms that you will, you, will, you will bring out in an army. They're military terms, right? So let's take one verse at a time. Uh, sorry, one word at a time. The first one is, church, I just want to know if you are watching with me. So it is? Watch, okay, watch. Now watch has many meanings, but here it talks about how to keep awake, to be vigilant, to be on your guard, and to be not surprised by your enemies. Now if you notice, these words are used um, specifically to, to help the Corinthian church to understand during their culture. Like if someone asks, tells us to watch, what would you probably do? You'd probably look at your watch, right? Because you don't have sentries and soldiers standing outside the city. But at that time, to protect the city, there used to be guards, right? So that they, they would be watchful to take care that no one would come inside the city, okay? No enemies would come inside the city. So when they were told to watch, they knew what they what what they were asked to do. It is to be vigilant, to be careful, to be awake, to look at kind of influences that are coming from outside, okay? And this, again, is something that is very consistent with scripture. You will have uh, this word, watch, and pray seen in so many other um, parts of scripture, like in Matthew chapter 26, 41, it says, watch and pray so that you do not fall into temptation. Or in 1 Peter 5.8, it says, be sober and vigilant because you have an adversary who's looking for an opportunity to devour you. Yes, okay? So the word watch does come, like it's like a timeless duty that we are supposed to do. Okay, now is this only for the Corinthian church? Are we sure? So we are to watch as well. We are to keep awake, be vigilant to see what are uh, things that could put us on shaky ground. So if you look at the Corinthian church, there were so many things that uh, could have just tipped them to the other side. So that's what Paul's saying. Watch, be awake, be vigilant. You know, don't, don't go to sleep. Ensure that you keep watching. So it's a duty that we also need to have to watch and always be on the lookout because who's lurking around? Yes, we have the devil lurking around. We also have different kinds of 
worldview that's lurking around. For us, it's probably different, not too different, but we do have a worldview. We, we do have other things that, that can easily take root in our own, own hearts. Amen? So we do, what do we do? We watch. Okay, let's look at the second one. It says, stand fast in the faith. So it's saying, stand firm in the faith. Stand, um, hold on to what you have received. Hold on to the truth that you know, the truth of the gospel that you know. Hold on to it. So again, it's a military term. So if you, if you, I don't know much of an army, so I had to do a bit of reading up. But then when you look at, look at an army, there are certain ranks that they, you know, they stand in, right? And if you have a gap in between, you know, it's, it's not good army strategy, I think, okay? So you need to ensure that your ranks are completely filled, you know? There cannot be gaps, because if there are gaps, that's when the army can lurk in. So that's exactly what Paul is saying. Stand firm, uh, do not be disorderly, keep your ranks, uh, keep close together, okay? So keep close together, again, is standing firm in your faith, knowing what your faith is about and living out that faith. So the second thing is stand fast in the faith. So what's the first thing, church? Watch. Second? Excellent. Okay. So let's look at the third word. The third says, be brave. Okay. Um, now, I didn't know this, but this is the word brave is never used in in the Bible before, okay? Uh, and what does this actually talk, is, uh, it means is be a man. Okay, women don't get offended. It just says be a man, not like a child. That's what it says, okay? Because it's a man who, who's ready to fight, who's ready to, you know, conquer, ready to give the blows. So it's saying be brave, be a man and, and, and fight and begin to conquer. Or when you're attacked, don't step back, you know, don't, you know, don't get back on the defense, start on the offense, conquer, give the blows, right? So, so if you look at Ephesians, Paul actually talks about putting on the, putting on the armor of God. So what are you doing? You are getting ready to fight, okay? So that's exa exactly what Paul is again saying, be brave so that you will press forward and you will conquer, and the last one he talks about is be strong, okay? Be strong, it again means to increase your strength, to be fit, to ensure that you, um, you know, if there is anything that you see that's weakening you, that's what you strengthen and go on all for it, okay? Now remember again, like I said, um, he calls for all this in the light of what has been happening in the Corinthian church in light of what has been diffused from the outside into the inside. And that's exactly what he's asking uh, the church to do. So he calls them to vigilance. He says, keep watching. He calls them to, to, to faith. He says, keep standing. And he calls them to courage and to be response, uh, as a response like a man in the midst of opponents, false teachers, persecution, the devil, whatever it may be, do that. And that, I believe, is the stand that we need to take even today. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to watch, stand firm in faith, be strong, and be brave. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now we move on to the uh, next section, which is verses 15 to 18. I'll read that again for you. I urge you, brethren, you know, the household of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia and that they have been devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that you also submit to such and to everyone who works and labors with us. I'm glad about the coming of Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus, for what was lacking on your part they supplied, for they refresh my spirit in yours, Therefore, acknowledge such men. Okay? It's like, I remember my dad used to write letters to me when I was in hostel. And he, the last paragraph would always be like, you know, mom did this, neighbors did that. They'll just give you a brief about what's happening. So I think that's exact, 
what he what he's doing so he's talking about he he's commending the people there he's recognizing the service of different people so he talks about stephanus who is the first probably the first believer in corinth and the other two people fortunatus and achaicus anyone thought of naming their children that okay that that they probably servants of uh, stephanus's home okay but paul commends them for their work and for their service okay so he's saying they did they did such a great job okay lastly is the final greeting um that is chapter 16 verses 19 to 24 i'll read that again the churches of asia greet you aquila and priscilla greet you heartily in the lord with the church that is in their house all the brethren greet you greet one another with a holy kiss the salutation with my own hand pauls if anyone does not love the lord jesus christ let him be accursed o lord come the grace of our lord jesus christ be with you my love be with you all in christ jesus amen so what paul's doing again here he's he's saying his final goodbyes and he said you know everyone saying hello to you and they hope you are well i'd like to bring your attention to verse 22 it says if anyone does not love the lord jesus christ let him be accursed so what is paul doing here he's having a very solemn close to this letter and i think he's doing it because it's it's really designed to direct their attention onto the love of jesus as against the disputes and dissensions that was going on in the church there was so much of focus about that and paul is saying you know at the end of it there is one focus that you have and it is your devotion and the love for jesus christ so he was bringing their focus to the right place he's saying yeah these things do happen we've gone ahead with this teaching we've done all of that but at the end of it let's call it what it is it is only our devotion and the love to jesus love for jesus that is alone connected to eternal life so that's what he's he specifically doing over there and then he closes it with a greeting and he closes it with a salutation and again he says you know this is your focus directs the focus back back to back to the lord jesus and i think that's such a beautiful lesson because you know when we are in a body when we are in a church when we are in families there are things that are going to um that we all may not agree about but there is one thing that we all agree about yes and that salvation comes from the lord jesus christ and that's what he's put it so well that the focus of everything up out of everything that he's spoken of is let's focus on the love of lord jesus christ and he blesses them with the grace of jesus so through this through this entire last chapter there are a couple of truths that we can we can just probably learn which i just like to um enumerate to you before we close so the first thing that he talks about is being good stewards of our finance okay let's learn to be what god has given us we be good stewards of it giving in to god's kingdom giving in to the local church not just that but also to those who may be in need it's to be good stewards of the opportunities that god provides us to be able to recognize it and to be able to respond to it it's also to um encourage and endorse young people in church to take on the work of god ahead it's also again teaches us to be watchful to be strong in the faith to be brave and to be to be strong in the things of god to be able to do all things with love and lastly it is to focus on the most important thing that god has called us for is to love and have a relationship with jesus amen amen may i please request you to stand up even as we um respond to what we have heard
All right, let's just put our hands together to Jean. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Great job. Let's just call our worship team up. Worship team, why don't you just please come up as well. Amen. We're going to take a few moments just to respond to um, the word. This morning, if uh, you just take a few minutes just to pray. Whatever God has spoken to you. Maybe God's stirred your heart saying, okay, you need to do something to help somebody as being a good steward of the money that God has put in your hands. Maybe God is saying, you know, look at opportunities that I've put before you. Seize those opportunities. Don't let them go. There may be adversities. There may be challenges. But God says, I've set before you an open door. Go through it. Don't pull back. Just because of the adversaries. He set an open door. Press through it. Or maybe just this morning, God is encouraging you and me saying, be brave, be strong, stand firm. So you respond to whatever God has spoken to your heart this morning. And um, Father, we just thank you for your words and for the things that we could learn. And this morning, Father, even in this place, I pray that every heart Every person who's come here, God, will be encouraged by your spirit, by your words. That God, what you have spoken through the mouth of your servant, the Apostle Paul, a long time ago still speaks to us today, this morning. That we are encouraged because these are the words of the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, thank you that you are speaking to each of us here this morning. There is a word from your heart coming to us even through the pages of the holy book that we've read, God, and we've heard explained to us. Thank you, you're speaking to us this morning. Father, I pray that those who need to be encouraged in their faith, God, to, to watch to stand firm in the faith, to be brave, to be strong, will be encouraged, will receive that strength, will receive that courage coming into their hearts this morning. We thank you, O oh God. We thank you. We bless you. Thank you, Father. Father, for those of us, Lord, who are seeing before us an open door, and though there may be adversaries, though there may be adversities, help us to recognize the door you've set before us and to seize the opportunity, to seize the moment, and to walk through with boldness and confidence, knowing that you will prepare the way. You will help us overcome adversities or adversaries even as we follow you through the doors through the opportunities you set before us Lord thank you oh God we thank you for your goodness thank you for your love Lord thank you is running after is running after me your goodness is running after is running after me 
my life lay down, surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. My life lay down, surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness, your goodness is running after, it's running after It's running after, it's running after me. My life lay down, surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Amen. Amen. Before we close this morning, we just want to give an opportunity for people to come to faith in Jesus, to love the Lord Jesus, to open up their lives to Jesus Christ. So the Bible tells us if any person is in Christ, he becomes a new creation. I mean, Jesus Christ makes us new. He changes our lives. He makes us brand new. He changes, he changes us from inside out. So there's anyone here this morning, you've never made a decision in your life to welcome Jesus in, to forgive you your sins, to make you a child of God. I'm going to lead us in a simple prayer. And if you've never done that before, I want to invite you to do that with us this morning. Just ask Jesus to come in, forgive you your sins, and make you a child of God to make you a new person. Just pray this with me, with every head bowed. Let's pray together. If there's anyone here, you've never prayed this prayer before in your life, I invite you to just pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive my sins. Come into my life. Make me a new person. Make me a child of God. And help me to follow you and you alone the rest of my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Anyone here, you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time this morning? I'd like to see your hand. I see one hand. Anybody else? Just put your hand up, please. Anybody else? You prayed this prayer with me for the very first time this morning. Just raise your hand. We want to celebrate with you. I want to thank God for you up in the balcony. If there's anyone with their hand raised up, our, our greeters are, will come to you. I see another hand right there near the window. Please put your hand up there. And uh, the person there, God bless you, right there near the window. Anyone else, just raise your hand. Our greeters will come and give you a welcome. A, a, a bag that has free resources in it. Also, there's a card that says decision card. If you could please write your name and your number on it. Uh, somebody from the church office will call you, will tell you how to use the resources in the bag and will guide you in your journey of faith. Let me just celebrate with you that this morning you made a decision to let Jesus Christ come in, change your life. Amen. All right. Uh, just one quick word. Uh, many of you would have received an email uh, stating that from the 1st of January, we will be meeting at the Good Shepherd Auditorium. It's right across uh, the street at Good Shepherd Auditorium. It's, it's a wonderful step. Now, I'll tell you a little bit of the history. You know, back in 2008 or sometime around that, you know, when we moved to the central part of our city, we actually asked Good Shepherd, can we rent your auditorium for Sunday services? And they said no. <laughs> and then this year, they asked us, would you like to rent it every Sunday? <laughs> oh. It really changed. You know? So they asked and so, you know, we negotiate a very good price. I won't tell you the price. 
<laughs> but it's very good price. And uh, I think a big blessing, I mean, it has many benefits, of course, it's a good auditorium, but and at least the good thing is we will not have to move from place to place on Sundays. <laughs> it's one fixed place. Every Sunday uh, is reserved for us uh, and uh, a lot of benefits. So, you know, I'm just, just looking back and seeing how God changed everything and, uh, you know, uh, for us to be able to use that auditorium. So from January 1st, but also means we won't have a New Year's Eve service. Uh, the police has put restrictions in this area not to have any big gatherings. So we won't be able to do our usual New Year's Eve service. Uh, so instead we'll meet on U.S. Day, 10.30. You'll have the same message. Don't worry. <laughs> you can sleep well and come. Uh, so that's a change we have to make for New Year's, uh, for New Year's Day. Uh, so that's it. So, yeah, so we're just happy and just thankful to God uh, for helping us take this step forward uh, and be blessed with a good auditorium to meet in starting January 1st. Amen. All right, so um, I just call our ministry team leaders, please come up, we make yourself available. Those of you who need prayer, our ministry team will be available for you to pray with you personally. Uh, once we close, you can just come forward, uh, meet with any of them. Uh, if you need personal prayer, they will be there to pray with you. Uh, so let's close, please. Father, we thank you for your goodness on our lives. In all our days, you have been faithful, God. You've been good to us. Thank you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet presence of His Holy Spirit, this, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, TV programs, publications, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, please visit apcwo.org slash Bible College. Please remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the app or Google Play stores.